Uh, not only am I doing the announcements today, but I also get to present. So there we go. I'm president of uh, Media Transport Solutions, a company established in 1996. Uh, we aid our customers. Get a little high gain there. Can we turn that down? Thank you. We help our customers uh, with any of the requirements between encoding and decoding, including uh, multiplexing, encryption of content streams, protected distributions, and uh, related telecommunications connectivity. Uh, this illustrates many of the requirements necessary for the transport of content from one place to another and is an example of the products and services offered by Media Transport Solutions. What I'm here to share today is how we can combine protocols available for free with low-cost internet services to result in high bandwidth, high reliability connections that will save your company or your customers a great deal of revenue from their operating budgets, making you the best friend of the accounting department and to receive a positive attention and callback from management and decision makers. So being displayed here is an actual invoice from a television station group for a bi-directional video connection between two properties within the same state. By the end of the presentation, I will show you how we replace this legacy service consuming $58,000 of their operating budget annually with an equally reliable service paid for at a cost less than the monthly taxes and surcharges charged on this legacy service. And you'll be able to do this also with the protocols that are freely available now. When I started in this field in 1986, the connections in use for voice and data services were analog based. Common data speeds were 9600 to 5600 kilobits and a dedicated line was a megabit and a half T1 service. A 45 megabit DS3 was considered to be extravagant. But what these connections had in common was a high service level. When you dialed a telephone number, established a fax or a modem connection, or contracted a T1 or a DS3 data service, the connection came with an inherent level of service providing the confidence that the line was secure for the duration of the call or the length of the contract. You essentially owned the wired connection between your telephones your modems or your fax machines or your data hardware between the origination and the destination. Inherent to the telephone company network, you knew what the performance characteristics were, that the path was secure, private, and would not be interrupted. Yes, compared to today's data speeds and range of services, the point-to-point dial-up or hardwired connections of old seem antiquated, but they were predictable, they were secure, and you owned the path. Those were the good old days, right? Today, for better or for worse, the majority of services available for high-speed transmission of data rely upon a diverse infrastructure and connectivity that is shared by many applications and many types of data. Gone are the days of purchasing a dedicated fiber between distant locations or leasing a private satellite transponder. Today's contracts include language like virtual private networks, Ethernet private line, multi-protocol layered switching, or other terms that indicate private network solutions. Yet they are each describing a way that a shared network is being segmented and isolated to offer the end user an exclusive service. As I reviewed the presentations being offered here at the IP Showcase, what I observed that they all have in common is that all are promoting advances in technology for the product or services they represent, especially a savings in cost over internet protocol connections. All are telecommunications-based, IP-based, and reliant upon connectivity, both within a facility and the connections between facilities or remote locations. The reliance upon this connectivity is at the very foundation of the productivity being discussed. If the connectivity is not there, the work does not get accomplished. Staff are not able to communicate, resources are not available, content is not delivered, and the viewers do not receive programming. If the reliable and secure connectivity is compromised, the topics being discussed and presented here will not function. What I'm going to describe is how RIST, Reliable Internet Streaming Transport, and SMPTE 2022 7 allows multiple, inexpensive, low quality telecommunications connections to be combined to achieve higher bandwidth, high reliability data services, usually associated with expensive telecom contracts that include a defined service level agreement. 
Many of these low-cost connections are available without contractual agreements or under inexpensive terms. When combined, the resulting cost remains far below the cost of a single contracted data service with a service level agreement. For today's example, we'll use a 25 megabit application adequate for an ATSC studio to transmit a connection or delivery of high definition content from a remote location or between venues. The purchase of a legacy video delivery service from an established local exchange carrier to deliver a video signal within a market was based upon a standardized rate of hundreds of dollars per mile, costing the customer thousands of dollars per month. A monthly bill could easily be $3,000 to $6,000 per month, depending on distance, and the connectivity was only one way, simplex, unidirectional delivery of the video data only. However, the service level agreement guaranteed that the service would not be interrupted by phone company maintenance, and if the connection failed, repairs were immediate. A private line data service offered by a telecommunication company, if available, would be similar in pricing. The high level of service could be guaranteed by installing a path twice with diverse routes for both the origination and the destination locations. But that comes at a cost because doubling the number of connections also doubles the volume of resources. This causes the monthly cost to also be very high. This is essentially the same as purchasing the same data service from two different companies and paying two separate monthly fees. So now we get to what was called the bonding of services where companies could place identical data connections. If one failed, the applications would migrate to the path that was still operational. As IP services matured, IP routing allowed for two paths to be maintained between locations, but the timing of video services is critical, and video services required an attacked path to maintain integrity. If one path failed, move to the other path, but this still requires the expense of two full bandwidth paths. The Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers addressed limitations in packetized video delivery by defining what became the 2019 SMPTE 2022-7 Standard Seamless Protection Switching of RTP Datagrams, which defines requirements for multiple redundant streams of RTP packets to allow for the creation of a single reconstructed output stream through seamless protection switching at the RTP datagram level. How's that for a mouthful? If you would prefer, the Wikipedia description is a standard that describes how to send digital video over an IP network. While both don't sound that exciting, what that means to us is that we can use low-cost connections to deliver the data that represents video without the requirement for engaging in expensive, high-cost contracted connections. In 2017, a group formed within the Video Services Forum to begin work on RIST, Reliable Internet Streaming Protocol. The goal was to create a secure and interoperable protocol between professional broadcast manufacturers' products that would enable previously non-compatible devices and platforms to seamlessly share content across the public internet. This was achieved in 2018, and since then, the additional features and capabilities have been added to the RISC protocol, including encryption, pre-shared and rotating keys, null packet suppression, high bitrate capabilities, and what I'm here to talk about, link aggregation. A very common public internet connection that is easily available in most areas today is a basic cable modem service. Benefits of a cable modem service include reasonable cost, reasonable throughput, reasonable availability, and common use practices. The downsides of cable modem include security concerns, it's a shared infrastructure, and you never know when the service will fail or the provider will conduct maintenance. A customer has no established level of service. A cable modem can be used to deliver video services, but without a service level agreement, the connection can degrade or drop at any time without recourse, and there's no requirement for immediate or urgent restoration of service. In this context, a fiber ISP is similar to cable modem service. Initially launched under the name Fios and now rebranded under different names as territories are sold or fiber to the home services roll out in new areas. Reliability and service concerns are similar to cable modem, but the download speeds are much higher and only a slight increase in the cost. One of the very first available and easily deployable internet services was copper-based DSL. 
Where available, digital subscriber line speeds are contingent upon the distance between the end location and the telephone company office. Their performance can easily degrade in bad weather or completely if a line is cut or during a power outage, and again, no SLA requiring urgent repair. Cellular modems are another band, low bandwidth option, but not a solution for streaming content, but can be used for packet delivery up to the limits of the subscriber's data plan. If the transmission speeds are low, packets are dropped, or the data plan is throttled, or connectivity is just not available, there's no recourse for the lack of service. And I should be clear about the uh, promotion of 5G services advertised today. These do not successfully scale to the streaming applications related to broadcast operations. We calculated that for the transmission of even a 5 megabit, megabit transport stream 24 hours a day over a 30-day month, over 1.6 terabytes would be consumed. Not terabits, terabytes, and we'd be hard-pressed to find a monthly cellular plan that would support 1.6 terabytes. Uh, a new data option is internet delivery by satellite, including HughesNet, Viasat, and now Starlink. But challenges for delivery of content with satellite delivery for broadcast video ap applications include bandwidth limitations, high latency, and the switching between satellites as the providing satellites orbit changes. Both cellular and satellite ISP can be used to complement full-time or temporary use applications, as I will demonstrate, but not effective for full-time reception of broadcast applications just yet. For those not familiar with WISP, wireless internet service providers are found most in expanding rural areas and often provided by electrical utility and electrical contracting companies. WISPs use licensed and unlicensed frequencies to deliver impressive up and download speeds to small antennas placed on subscribers' homes or businesses. These act as geographically shared networks at very affordable prices, often a third of a comparable cable or fiber modem service, uh, and are not found in the same de deployment areas uh, as WISPs. If this service is fairly reliable and an excellent choice for low-priced, high-bandwidth internet con connectivity. So what I've displayed uh, is kind of a selection of mediocrity without a compelling reason to reliably switch to any one of these as a primary connection for professional broadcast operations. But what I can illustrate is that by applying RIST, we can switch to a combination of these connections for less than the cost of a dedicated private line and achieve the same bandwidth and the same level of service reliability as a contracted service without the high monthly cost. Connecting RIST-enabled devices at each location implements SMPTE 2022 7 which is integrated within RIST as part of the family of protocols that define RIST. IP packets routed between the connected devices will take advantage of the configured pass regardless of the transport method or medium. The packets don't recognize a difference in the physical path. The packets are traversing a virtual private network established between the two points. They are divided between pathways based upon available bandwidth and the reassembly of the packets are in order at the distant end. If a packet is lost or arrive late, a missing packet can be requested to be sent again to be played out on time. If a path is determined to be too congested, it's slow or not in service, the other paths will accept an increase in the packet traffic, compensating for the performance of the slower or the degraded path. This is transparent to the user who is not required to intervene while the RIST algorithms compensate as necessary. Some instances of RIST implementations do include alarming and notification functions to alert the user if a path is not performing as intended. Other software packages, such as those now available from Alvalinks, provide deeper real-time network analysis on every aspect of a shared network and the unrelated data that your content is sharing the network with. Now to some examples. If we pick a remote location, like a television broadcast tower, and we find that we, we, uh, our research determines that we have a choice of DSL connectivity from the local telco, a cable modem from the local cable provider, a wireless internet service from a local electrical contractor, and an option for cellular or satellite. In this instance, use of the cable modem and the WISP are adequate. Independently, each offer enough download bandwidth to support the video application to the location. 
applying RIST will ensure the application is supported across both paths. Should one path fail, like if the local cable company takes the area with the cable modem down for overnight maintenance, or a car accident knocks down the connecting utility poles, RIST will seamlessly migrate packet reliability to the operational path of the RIT WISP transport without user intervention. This application maintains 100% uptime at a combined cost of, let's estimate, $250 a month, which remains far below the cost of a dedicated 50 megabit Ethernet private line or MPLS connection with an SLA prices exceeding more than $1,000 a month. Another example, this time combining a configuration that's more complex with cellular and satellite, a difficult location Maybe the broadcaster has an IP radio or a microwave connection, and they want to also use a wireless internet service provider and add cellular and satellite as a backup. But you don't want to stream over the cellular connection because of bandwidth caps, and the satellite internet connection has bandwidth limitations as well. A storm is passing, and the throughput of the IP or the microwave radio is degraded. During the configuration process, using regular router configuration rules, we've previously specified that the IP port for the cellular path is rate limited to a couple of megabits. Applying a similar rule to the IP port designated for the internet satellite path, rate limited not to exceed a few megabits. Collectively, the combined path of the IP radio, the WISP, the internet satellite, and the cellular modem can maintain the necessary 25 megabit throughput. To ensure efficiency of the payload, another risk feature could be activated, null packet suppression, helping to further reduce the payload. The result would continue delivery of the transport stream across multiple paths for a collective monthly cost of, let's say, $500 per month, plus a $2,000 capital investment for the IP radio. I could continue with combinations of transport medium, including several cable modems if more than one cable modem provider is available at a location, and I do recommend bonding together several, diff several cable modems if that's an option, well, as that will provide extremely high reliability and high download bandwidth when configured correctly. What I'm demonstrating is that by combining multiple low-cost service providers, an application can achieve high, relative, high, high reliability uh, compared to a single provider without the high cost associated with expensive service level agreements. It, we are breaking out data packets across multiple routes to be reassembled at the destination. If any of the routes is not available, the packets will take another route. If a packet is lost, delayed, or corrupted, a new packet is requested and delivered to ensure the resulting data stream is intact. We accomplish this by taking the least expensive route, but duplicating that least expensive route multiple times, not by traversing the most expensive route only once. The result is that we deliver an intact transport stream to the destination for a cost at least 50% lower than the initial cost of a dedicated line. And another reason that risk contributes to savings? RIST is free, provided under a RAND-Z agreement, resulting in no licensing costs. I did say at the beginning of the presentation I would show the differences between the initial customer invoice and the resulting service invoices. We started with this, $4,800 a month, $58,000 annually, and we concluded with this, $620 a month plus 50 bucks a month for the WISP. We replaced the $4,800 a month service for a cost less than half of the taxes and surcharges from the previous bill. Now the monthly expense is $710 a month, which is 14% of the legacy service, and we saved this customer $50,000 a year. And with what I've just explained to you, you can now apply these same resources to your customers and to your companies as well. So I've described the connectivity is now the foundation for the applications and the transport of all of the topics being discussed here at the IP Showcase uh, throughout the NAB, and that we can do this implementing uh, low-cost connections by applying RIST and SMPTE 2022. So with that, I'll do the best I can to answer any questions. So thank you.